Um, I'm Angela Mettler. I'm an administrative assistant in the president's office at South Dakota Mines. Uh, we have been doing Steam Cafe since April of 2018. And Steam Cafe is a partnership between Mines, Hay Camp, and South Dakota Public Broadcasting. So we'd like to thank them for their support. And we would like to thank all of you for your support as well. We would not be able to keep doing this if you guys weren't here, either in person or virtually. Um, I do apologize, we're having some live streaming issues with Facebook and YouTube. So uh, this will only be live broadcast on Zoom tonight, but it will be uploaded to Facebook and YouTube later this week uh, for people to watch. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Kaylee. Hello. nice to see everyone who's turned out. Hopefully those that are on the digital realm are having a good night too. My name's Kaylee. I'm here to talk about a T-Rex. So uh, to get to know you guys, you already know my name. Um, a little bit about my background. I got my bachelor's and my master's at South Dakota School of Mines and ended up taking a position as the preparator and lab manager there. So I'll tell you a little bit about my job before we really start talking about the T-Rex so you kind of have an idea of what I get to do and why I do it. So for the managing side of my position, I'm lucky enough to vol or volunteer, manage my volunteers in the lab. And I've also helped reinvigorate, restructure our volunteer program. So shameless plug, if you're interested in volunteering either in the fossil prep lab in collections or on the museum floor. We're always looking for volunteers and I'm happy to answer any questions about that or tell you more about that after this presentation. I also get to manage the paleontology research lab. So when you think about the Museum of Geology, you're probably thinking of our main exhibit floor that's in the O'Hara building or the administrative building on campus. But right behind that building, we actually have a facility that houses the rest of our collection. So most museums only how, or or even off of the facility site. So this building contains our collections as well as our labs for the paleo department. And so I basically get to make sure that nothing falls apart, the building doesn't catch on fire, you know, everything looks pretty so that we can maintain our fossils. I'm also lucky enough to teach students what my job actually is. So I teach a, a class every spring semester or every other spring semester, uh, telling them how to prepare and conserve fossils, whether they're out of the ground, still in collections. And so you're probably kind of wondering what is actually a fossil preparator? Maybe you've heard the word preparator before. There's art preparators out there, so they can serve artworks, or sometimes they're helping set up art galleries, make sure that exhibitions go you know, without, a, without a hitch, basically. Um, so a fossil preparator does about the same thing. We work to conserve our fossils by preparing them from the field, exposing them in the rock or the matrix, and then also making sure that they're stable enough for scientific research, display, or storage. So fun fact, this is actually Harold Martin in about the 40s and 50s. He actually did most of the mounts you see today in the Museum of Geology, including the lovely Bronothier that you guys see on the slide here. So he's a, a good example of uh, the exhibit side of preparation. He put together a lot of those exhibits. So sometimes we mount specimens so that people can go ooh and ah over them. But a lot of the times it's actually really dirty work. Um, the preparation side is really taking specimens that came from the field. So say we go out on the river this summer, we find this wonderful mosasaur, we jacket it. So the jackets are typically made out of plaster and burlap bandages. Just like if you broke a bone, you have to wrap up your bones so that they don't break. If you think of fossils, they've been in the ground for millions and millions of years. And so they need some kind of support so they don't break apart. So that's where I come in. Once those jackets are put in my lab or in receiving, I get to work with them. I get to remove the rock to reveal the fossil so that we can actually 
research those specimens, see what species it is, if we can see the species. A lot of the times we can only get down to even a family, maybe a genus. Uh, so a good example of that is actually this mosasaur. This was a specimen that was found probably in the 2000s and has been worked on in the lab since about 2015. So I actually worked on it as a student here. I started out as a volunteer on this project with my predecessor who was the preparator at the time. And then when I got this position, I had to finish it. Uh, it's a lot of work. Um, I will say that it wasn't eight hours a day, day in, day out for five years. However, there was you know, easily 400 hours put into something like this. And so if you guys look at the top right part of your screen over where, I don't know if there's a laser pointer on here, where this pink string is, this is actually the head of the mosasaur. So we got part of the skull, we didn't get a lot of it, but then we have this beautifully articulated spinal column right there. You can see some of the ribs sticking out. We also have part of the shoulder girdle. It's kind of hard to see, but it's just the shoulder blades. And then the front flippers are also preserved. So we got a good amount of the specimen. Um, it does take a lot of hard work. A lot of it is power tools. This specimen are, in particular had very hard rock around the middle of it. Um, so even stronger power tools. So it does take some skill. It takes some high, high patience and a lot of dedication to really fully prepare something to where it's research ready. So that's kind of half of my job is the preparing stage. The other half of my job is actually the, conser the conservation stage where I go back into collections. I find things that look absolutely terrible like this. This is a set of hips from an archaeotherum. So an archaeotherum is a big pig. If you've ever heard of Badlands, uh, this actually comes from Badlands National Park and the big pig dig that was found in 1993, was excavated for many, many years till about 2008. And so we've had a project to go through this collection, find things that are absolutely horrible that need some kind of work. So if you look here, you can see there's some breaks. Uh, the jacket itself was failing so I could peel the jacket apart. There was plastic underneath it for some reason. I, I don't know why. Um, so part of my job is to make sure that this ends up looking like the picture on the right and is much more pretty, it's stable, it's reinforced so that it can be studied, it can be handled if it needs to. It's resting in a much more stable jacket. And so I've mentioned that the jackets we used in the field were made of plaster and burlap. So anything that goes into our collections nowadays, we give them a new jacket. It's usually made out of plaster and fiberglass. Fiberglass is a lot stronger and you can make a bigger jacket without as much weight because it is such a stronger material. Uh, so that's kind of the, the, the beautiful finished product. And so that actually brings me to our lovely, lovely T-Rex specimen. But before I really start digging down and telling you about the work that I've been doing on it, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the history of this specimen. It is a very historic specimen and I will put in a disclaimer in there. This is actually work in progress. So I'm sorry, you won't see a finished product, but you'll see some of the work that I've uh, been able to do with this specimen. So picture it, 1981. <laughs> you're in Mud Butte, South Dakota, and you're a rancher. You're in your, your land, maybe you're riding around on a horse or something, and you spot something eroding out of a hillside. You've always kind of wondered what these chocolatey looking bones maybe would have been, or if it was a bone at all. Uh, and this is exactly what a couple by the name of Shirley and Jennings Floden were thinking in 1981. They were talking to one of their, their, their rancher neighbors, uh, Bill Marty, and they were like, we just, you guys have bones, we have bones, I don't know what's going on. So these guys were smart enough to contact the state archeologist of South Dakota and try to figure out what was going on. Unfortunately, they contacted an archeologist. Archeologists only study human remains. They really focus on prehistoric humans, not deep time prehistoric life. So they go you know, 10,000 to maybe 100,000 years ago. We go millions of years. So the archeologist was kind enough to forward the information onto this man. This was the director at the time, Dr. Philip York. 
And he was like, aha, I'm so excited that somebody found fossils because he probably looked at a map, looked at where Mud Butte was on the map. It's kind of hard to see on this projector, but there's this like muddy green, kind of like swamp color green geological formation. Um, not actually green in real life. These are just color coding. Um, but he knew this, this was the Hell Creek formation. So Hell Creek formation is late Cretaceous in age. It's uh, an intertidal, or not intertidal, um, but like kind of coastal area. So the rest of South Dakota at the time would have been in a seaway. So all of the green surrounding it on this side of the state would have been part of the Western Interior Seaway. So a lot of the material we find, just like that Mosasaur I showed you guys, would have actually been part of the seaway. Fun fact, Mosasaurs are not dinosaurs. They were swimming around in the ocean being their own thing. They're marine reptiles. Um, unfortunately for them, they had to walk on land and have a correct hip structure, so they weren't dinosaurs. But Dr. Bjork was super excited because somebody might have found a dinosaur. So he and uh, Dr. McDonald went out in the May of 1981 and decided to check it out, see what was cracking with these guys. So first they went over to Bill Marty's ranch, and this is actually Bill. He, he helped them jacket what they found on his ranch and they found a shoulder blade of a triceratops. Pretty cool. Um, they also looked at what the Flodens had on their land and was like, eh, this could be promising, but we don't have enough time, so we'll come back. And so they eventually revisited it in July of that year, found a rib and a limb bone, and they're like, all right, all right, this site has some promise. And so the next time they came out, uh, all the ranchers in the area, I'm sure they had some kind of heavy equipment, and they actually dug this butte out down to the bone layer, which is about right there. If you can't see it, there's a red circle. And so at this point, it was August, it was the 17th. They had a ton of volunteers helping them out. I'm sure it was a mix of you know, students, other paleontologists, ranchers in the area. And they started to find more bones. So that morning, August 17, 1981, somebody found a tooth and they were like, rock on, it's a tooth. What is it, Phil? And Phil was like, oh, I don't know. It's, it could be a, a, a dinosaur and it's probably a carnivore. So at that point, they probably found this beautiful banana shaped tooth. Um, if you know what a T-Rex tooth is, they're very comparable to bananas. Um, but he didn't tell them it was a T-Rex just yet because he wanted to be absolutely sure he did not want to get people's hopes up. So when they started finding more and more teeth and finally hit bone, he was like, okay, I think I can tell you that it's a T-Rex. I'm pretty confident at this point. So that day they had found the lower left edge of the skull of a T-Rex. And that is very historic for one point and one point alone. It was the sixth T-Rex ever found in the entire world that had part of the skeleton and the skull. So that's pretty awesome for Museum of Geology. Um, so they were very excited. Everybody was super happy about this. And because of that, they ended up coming back for a total of 17 trips to the site. They pulled out a ton of stuff, all while keeping quiet to the media, have you? Which granted that would be easier to do in 1981 versus today. Uh, but they did find a good amount. Oh, no, we're going too fast. I'm panicking. My computer is an ancient dinosaur itself. So, oh, oh God. The technology ghost has forsaken us or they're playing with us. I'm gonna let it alone. Okay, so during this time when they were in this little quarry, um, and I'm sure it was bigger than this, those are just the pictures I could find. Uh, take pictures, those are super important in the future. Uh, they found the skull, both pairs of the jaw, so right and left side. They also found seven ribs, a couple do or a dozen or so vertebrae, and they also found two species of crocodile, some gar scales, and three teeth from an Albertosaurus. So it was actually a pretty productive site. Um, they would actually end up coming back the next year and finding more uh, of this T-Rex too, but I'm focusing on that initial excavation. And so finally, after so many months, they went to the media in September of 1981, finally told them, oh my gosh, we got a T-Rex, yay! And then came probably the most butt-clenching moment of anybody's life. 
um, which would be flipping the jacket. So if you think of a T-Rex skull, they're, they're pretty big. So this jacket was eight feet long, five feet wide, so about my height, a huge beast of a jacket. And so in October of that year, they had to get a crane to lift it out. Not as cool as the helicopter ride that a Triceratops skull got the year before, but still pretty cool. Dr. Bjork was a pretty smart man too. He was kind of paranoid whether or not this would all work out. So he actually took out insurance on this jacket for $10,000. Um, I, I can luckily tell you that after all of the stress, all of the miniature heart attacks and everything that went down, they successfully did pull it out of the ground and transported it to the Museum of Geology, where it went into the hands of this amazing person. This is Merton Bowman. And at the time he was the preparator and exhibits curator at the Museum of Geology. So it was in his hands to prepare this awesome beast of a specimen. And funny enough, his background was actually in sculpting with a touch of anatomy knowledge. Um, so there is a very good correlation between being an artist and being a preparator. You do have to have a level of dexterity, eye for talent, hand-eye coordination to really make this um, a successful feat. Uh, fun fact about myself, I almost went to art college. So this combines my art with also making sure that we're doing science. And so he worked painstakingly on this specimen. And I imagine there were probably students that helped with like the ribs and the vertebrae, uh, but I'm quite sure that he worked mostly on the skull and the jaws of this awesome beast. Um, however, I can't say for sure because I do not have documentation of that. Um, so nowadays we always take notes. We make sure that we're documenting everything. However, back in the day, this maybe wasn't as much the case Either that or I just haven't found the notes yet. That's always a possibility. Um, but he really did a lot of work on this specimen and the result you can see today in the Museum of Geology. So this is the skull of that amazing Mud Butte T-Rex. And this is actually a top view. So it's kind of hard to tell what it is. You can see the teeth and everything. You got some teeth right here. Um, so this is the maxilla. You'd have his eye around this area, back of the skull. But what you guys see today in the Museum of Geology is more of this angle. So it's even harder to recognize what this is. And so this is one of the reasons I've kind of started working on this specimen. My like pipe dream goal would be able to mount this a little bit better. So it's more recognizable, more similar to the mount we have of the Aim and H T-Rex. So if you go into the Museum of Geology today, you will also see this uh, T-Rex skull on display. However, this is a reproduction of the original, so it's not the Mud Butte T-Rex, it's actually from an a and T-Rex that was found a much longer time ago. But it would be really awesome to do something for that, for the skull. However, my work really focuses on this dentary. And even before I got to it in 2010, Michelle Pinsdorf, who is now a uh, preparator assistant research researcher and um, collections assistant at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum in DC, also worked on this specimen and did some of her master's research on the osteology of the specimen, looking at the bone structure. She actually found that there was a possible um, pathology on the left maxilla of the skull. So it's possible that our T-Rex got in a tussle, broke his bones and then it healed back together. Um, she also worked on the dentary, as you can see here, she's working on part of the jaw. And so this is actually where my story starts to, to unfold with the dentary. However, you're probably hearing jaw and dentary interchangeably. So I don't actually have the entire jaw here. I have this anterior portion or the front of the jaw that actually contains the teeth. We do have the rest of this jaw in collections, but this is really the main portion that we have. And so when I was a lowly grad student back in uh, 2018, this is how I received the specimen. I was a volunteer in the lab. Uh, Kelsey, who at the time was the lab manager before me had been working on this specimen. She did a wonderful job cleaning it up um, it's hard to see on the projector, but you'll see it in a little bit. There's these black marks that look like cracks. 
And so what she did is she filled all the gaps in the, the T-Rex dentary with something called epoxy. So this is a two-part epoxy that's like a putty, super easy to sculpt. When it dries, it's super strong. It's a super strong kind of glue-like structure. And it's really useful when you have dinosaur-sized specimens that need something super strong. So it looked beautiful. The only issue with it is that the edge of the jacket needed to be finished. There is another side to the jacket that also needed to be finished. So I started to just finish the jacket. So I cut it. You can see my nice little smooth edges around the jacket, um, you know, reinforcing it with some, or sealing it with some boot var, labeling it, making sure that it's ready for when I put it on top of that, that dentary, flip it over. And so I can finish the other side of the jacket. So this is what it looked like flipped over. And I was kind of surprised, to be honest, that the rest of it still had all this white stuff in it. There's a little bit of a yellowing mystery glue right here. It could be carpenter's glue. I still have no idea. Um, so I was like, OK, like that's interesting. And then because of gravity and Murphy's Law, uh, when I flipped it, I also broke it. So that was. Um, interesting as a grad student breaking a T-Rex in half. Um, so I, you know, I had a couple teeth that fell off. Part of the dentary just literally snapped in half. Although I'm lucky to say that that was on an existing um, crack. So it wasn't something I did myself. And so I spent a while putting the teeth back on the specimen using this glue right here. This is called Paraloid B72. It is a plastic polymer that is dissolvable in acetone and ethanol. It's actually at the, the head of uh, the preparation and conservation field in paleontology and many other conservator fields. It's well known for its aging properties. So when you're a conservator, you also want to think about what's good for the fossil. You don't want gross stuff that's going to yellow and become brittle over time, which is why we had the problem in the first place. Um, so I was trying to use the glues that were the most stable, sta stable, uh, stable, and also the cool thing about this, because it is dissolvable in those those uh, solvents, acetone and ethanol. If I messed up, I could fix it. Um, unlike epoxy, which is a, a one try thing, you you can't you, you know either you get it right or you don't. It's kind of a game over, man. Um, so I was doing that and I was, you know, studying the specimen. I got the teeth back on and I was like, okay, now what? Should I try to glue this back together with paraloid? My answer was no, because paraloid's only good for small to medium sized specimens. If you get anything over like five pounds, it's going to fail on you. So I could have tried the black epoxy that Kelsey had used earlier. But because I was still pretty inexperienced at the time, I ended up con consulting with Kelsey, texting her, being like, I broke the T-Rex. What do I do? Um, and so we ended up deciding that this T-Rex really, really needed an overhaul. And so our definition of that is basically breaking it apart piece by piece and putting it back together. So that means I'm removing all of this crazy white stuff, which at the time I still didn't know what it was. And then that black epoxy, which is very, very hard to actually remove. And so I started that process. I started it with the posterior portion of the dentary. So that's um, towards the hind of the animal. And so I purposely started breaking it in pieces. Some of the tools I use are right here. So on the left, you have a pin vise, which is basically this vise grip that grips needles. Uh, usually they're like a tungsten carbide needles. This picture has like little screws, but usually they're very sharp, very pointy, maybe chisel tipped, uh, very useful for some of the removal process. And also these air scribes that are on the right. This is the Paleo Tools series. So on top, we have the super tiny little one. And as we go down, we go to the six, which is more powerful. Um, so I had that at my disposal at the time. So you'll see my, my little pin vise right there with the rest of the dentary uh, for scale. And so I started working on this stuff. And I really didn't know what it was at the time. I ended up talking to Kelsey and finding out it's paper mache or something similar to that. 
um, which if you've ever worked with paper mache, it's not very strong stuff. And they were trying to keep a 30 pound T-Rex jaw together with it. Um, so strike one for them, which they probably didn't know at the time. Um, and also the other thing about paper mache is that I don't know what kind of paper they are using. If it was some kind of paper that was not acid free, that can actually chemically affect our fossil. So that was also a big no-no, that's strike two for them. Um, you'll see strike three in a minute as well. Um, but lucky for me, this paper mache is super easy to remove. All I needed to do was wet it with some water, peel it up with that pin vise. On the other side, however, I have a, a bigger challenge to work with as epoxy is extremely hard. I can't chemically dissolve it in any way um, that would be safe for the fossil at the same time. So that's where those air scribes come in, those paleo tools. Uh, those are amazing for doing some mechanical removing. So I would use those to slowly grind away at all of this black stuff, all of these cracks, all of that epoxy. And as I was doing this, I found that a lot of these pieces start fitting together way better than you would expect them to. Um, I haven't, I, I'll be honest with you guys, I haven't glued a lot back together yet. I'm still removing things from this piece of bone and I'll explain that in a minute as well. Um, but as I was cleaning these, I was finding they're actually fitting better and better together. So I'm like, okay, I've got some super big hope for this specimen. You know, I'll keep going. And as I'm going, I'm actually cleaning the edges of these puzzle pieces and also taking pictures, drawing as I go. So I know exactly where something goes. So when I'm ready to put pieces back together, I can do that easily as possible. And so cleaning those edges of the puzzle pieces, as you'll see right here, um, it's a little hard to see, uh, but you can see there's these vents in the back. This is actually in one of my chambers. So I have something called an air abrasion unit, specifically ours are Comco microblasters. They're basically like miniature sandblasting units, except we don't use sand. We actually use the very technologically advanced baking soda. Um, it's actually softer than something like sand and is a little bit more gentle on the fossil. And so I've been using it to clean off any leftover ancient glue any ancient paper mache and of course any of the epoxy. So we end up with this ugly, dirty area to a nice clean puzzle piece side. And the reason we do that is so that when we do put them back together, they're a nice clean fit join. They're gonna fit more snugly and they're actually gonna stick together better as well. And so became the odyssey of the T-Rex. I would start to remove some more of that paper mache, flip it over, work on the other side, try to remove more of the epoxy, break it apart, and then clean it with the edges and repeat the process. However, when I started working in this area just to remove some of that paper mache, I found strike three. There is a mystery mesh inside of my dinosaur and I don't know what it is. It's some kind of plastic, um, no documentation whatsoever as to why it's there. Um, I'm sure they put it in there to try to support this, this gap a little bit more, but it was a bit of a surprise. I didn't know that was gonna happen. So, and I'm sure I'm gonna find more surprises as I go on. And so, you know, I went on with my life, started taking more stuff apart and to be honest, that's where I am at this journey. I started it in 2018. Um, honestly, I've probably put in maybe 30 hours on this specimen. You can see part of that dentary is now missing right here. Um, and unfortunately, the reality of my job is a lot of the times I'm paid to work on other specimens. So the Museum of Geology is a federal repository meaning we actually house a lot of federally owned specimens and they're not actually our specimens. We'll you know, house them for them, we'll curate them, we'll prepare them, and then they'll pay us a little bit of money in order to do those jobs. So a lot of the times I'm actually paid to work on other things. So this T-Rex is my free time uh, project. So that's really all that's happened right here, but I'm excited to see how this you know, ends up turning out as I work on it. And if you guys are curious to see what the other side of the dentary is, 
that's actually on display now in our new history exhibit in the Paleontology Research Lab. And with that, uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. I think he's, I think he's, well, you, you're, you're loud enough. I think you'll be good. Okay. No worries. You mentioned kind of the excitement of realizing that the fossil was a T-Rex, and part of that being the rarity of the fossil. How much of that is also due to kind of the cultural purchase that T-Rex has? No children's books, Jurassic Park, that sort of thing. Oh, definitely. So this was before Jurassic Park. I will mention that. Um, so, but... And there's, there's been a lot of studies on this too, but when dinosaurs became a household term, that was actually in the early 1900s. So dinosaur had been a big word for a long time. Um, and in that era, that's when the first T-Rex was actually found by Barnum Brown. Um, so it's been a common, common name for a long time. And really it's that, that mysticism behind dinosaurs of like, whoa, there's this huge ass animal that, excuse me, no one's ever said before, <laughs> no one's ever seen before. Um, so, you know, it's always held the public in wonder since about the 1890s, 1900s. So um, it, it's really become part of our pop culture. And of course, since, you know, Jurassic Park has really brought that into Hollywood, um, it's become even more so. Yeah. I don't know who, I saw Mike first. A lot. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know how I would estimate it, but probably a, you know a good amount of money. Um, you know, funding's pretty 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 uh, low here, and especially with COVID, we've been kind of uh, plucking at at different funds to keep ourselves running. Um, I know there's a couple grants out there that we could apply for. Hours wise, it depends on how many people are working on it. If it's just me on top of the rest of my job, probably a very long time. Um, you know, if we could get the expertise to, you know, maybe mount it the correct or a correct way um, and really, you know, get that kind of stuff, I'm sure it would be much more than I could ever dream of, probably over 50 to $100,000. So, yeah. And I, and I definitely by no means have any idea how to mount something like that. Um, that would take a lot of metalworking, so probably outsourcing like blacksmiths and things like that too, um, if we want to go that route. Yep. Okay, Kelly. That's actually something I'm working on. Um, someone from Badlands is gonna teach me how to do more photogrammetry. Um, and we actually do use it in the field. Uh, Darren and I will go out um, and certain specimens, if they're either deemed important or they're like on the borderline of whether or not they should be collected. Um, and that has a lot of factors in its own. We will perform photogrammetry on it. So we have some kind of digital database of specimens. Um, you know, maybe we run out of time in the field and we want to make sure that when we come back, we know what it looks like. Um, we haven't quite started doing that with some of our collections, uh, simply just because we don't have the training or the manpower. Um, however, we're, we're trying to move towards that. And I know um, there's a couple people on campus that are also interested in pursuing that um, and trying to get a digital database out there so we can 3D print stuff like that or it can be super useful for researchers if they can't make it to an institution. So short answer is yes. Originally prepared, um, it probably started in either early or late 1981 or 82. Um, I'd imagine they probably started it right away. Um, because it was such a high priority specimen. So as a preparator, uh, you're usually told what to do. So, you know, if you have something that you want researched or a researcher comes in and is like, I need to see this, that's usually what the preparator works on. Uh, 
This is a completely different animal. Um, Sue is currently at um, the Chicago Field Museum. So that's a completely different one. I think that was found in 91. Um, but yeah, that one's completely different. Yep, this one was privately owned and the Flodens were gracious enough to donate it to the museum. Anything else? Go ahead. Um, that's a good question. I don't personally know. Um, we don't do a lot of work in the Hell Creek uh, as the museum itself. Um, a lot of our surveys are for federal land management, management agencies, which happen to be more in the Western Interior Seaway part of things. So we might find the next awesome mosasaur, a new species of turtle or something like that. Um, but it's not impossible if, you know, some other rancher finds a T-Rex or, you know, other, another dinosaur. So I would hope it's from South Dakota, fingers crossed, but it could be, you know, Wyoming, North Dakota. Um, I know North Dakota has been finding some good Tyrannosaur material recently. Um, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but there's many more since the 80s. Um, that just happened to be the sixth one ever found at that time. Um, I don't know a number off the top of my head, though. It's probably in the 40s or 50s. It could be more, um, but it just depends on, like, the condition of it, you know, how much of it was found. So for this specimen, it was about 50% complete compared to Sue, which was much more of a complete find. Um, so as, you know, good condition they are, how complete they are, usually um, will tell you the popularity of a specimen as well. Um, so it's a little bit more every day now that, oh, we found another Tyrannosaur tooth or something like that. But complete skeletons are um, usually bigger deals. Uh, the, the scapula, I believe so, yes. Yep. I think that's it, so thank you guys. Anybody have any other questions? Have you have one more. Yeah, so the Forest Service actually has their own program, which I have some lovely volunteers here from that program. Um, that is the Passport and Time Project. Um, and so you can search Passport and Time U.S. Forest Service online, see what they're usually about. Um, they have a lot of archaeological, some paleontological projects. So you're more than welcome to get involved with the Forest Service volunteer programs. The Museum of Geology has its own volunteer program. So we open up our doors to new volunteers three times a year. So at the beginning of the fall semester, so that's usually about late August, beginning of the spring semester, so that's usually mid to late January, and then in the summer. So we've kind of passed our threshold for the summer. That's usually around mid-May or so. Um, but if you're open to volunteering, I can always get your contact information and we can talk about it from there. Um, but we do have positions that are typically available within those three realms. So my prep lab, collections on the exhibit floor, uh, doing a wide variety of inf or information, different projects, things like that. Um, and if you want more information, you can go to our website, go to the Museum of Geology. Uh, our website's kind of nested into the, the South Dakota Mines uh, website, uh, but there's information on there as well. I think if you go to the Collections tab or About tab and you drop down, there's a Volunteers tab right there as well. Um, so that'll give you an idea. It has a couple of descriptions of the different projects and stuff like that. Yep. Anything else? All right. 
just wanted to say again, thank you for presenting tonight. Thank you everybody for coming and to those who joined us online. Again, sorry about the technical issues with Facebook and YouTube, but this will be posted uh, later this week on both of those pages. Um, we do this every third Tuesday. So next month will be July 20th. And I'm actually looking for a presenter at this time. I don't have anybody lined up. So if anybody has any ideas, feel free to give me a shout out. Um, but we will have somebody by next month. So thanks for coming. Thank you.